Ciao ragazzi! This is Katie Portanova, and you're listening to Florence and Me. I'm a lover of stories and all things Italian, and I'm going to bring you all that in this podcast. My intention is to inspire you to step out of your comfort zone and explore life and travel the world. Join me as I tell you my story and many others about Italy and my love, Florence. Andiamo! Buongiorno a tutti! We are back for another episode of Florence and Me with my friend Julia. Welcome back, Julia. Hello. Thank you for having me, as usual. Yes, <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Especially on a tough day for for us as a family. My father-in-law um, passed away a year ago today. Um, it's really surreal because you think one minute they're there and one minute they're not. And I can't believe a year has passed. So it's been it's been a rough re- week for us. Um, <clears throat> the other thing before we jump into the episode, I want to point out um, the deadline to sign up for our Wine and Relax retreat is March 12th. And uh, there are six spots available. Um, I've got some information out on my website. You can look up all the stuff on my um, on my website. And if you have any questions about it, feel free to email me, trulyitalytours at gmail.com. And if you want, want to talk on the phone about it, we can talk about your options and stuff. Um, but it's going to be an amazing week. So... Just to book your spot, you just need to give in, uh, put in your deposit, and then we can go from there. Um, but yeah, girlfriends, bring anybody, group of people. So yes. <laughs> and the commercials are done. Okay. <laughs> we are, today we're talking about the best dishes in Italy to try or to just devour every single day in Italy, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good start. <laughs> um, the, um, I mean, we're, I, we have no order, rhyme or reason for which dishes we like. So we're kind of just going to f- jump right in. Julia, give me one of your dishes that if you, if somebody from, from outside of Italy is coming to visit, what's the first one you say you have to try? Um, well, I think I gave this a lot of thought and I mm-hmm. even spoke to my husband a little bit about it because it's so difficult to pinpoint exactly which ones to try. And it, obviously it depends on when you are there in Italy, you know, because a mm-hmm. lot of the food is very seasonal and many of the restaurants will be seasonal. Um, so I think if you're going to be in, in Florence, um, which most of the, the listeners here are probably going to be visiting. I would definitely say that Parpadelle alla cinghiale is mm. one of the things to definitely try. So it's a um, type of pasta dish, and Parpadelle are a lot like tagliatelle. They're just a lot wider. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, I think they're like, I actually can't remember the size, but they're quite thick. And... Yeah. The sauce that the meat sauce that's made with cinghiale, which is wild boar, is unlike any other meat sauce that you'll ever have in your life. And you're not you're not really going to be able to get to try that anywhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it has story. Um, with every it's something my husband said, with every dish in Italy, there is a story behind it. And you know, every family's got an arsenal of recipes that they absolutely live by and abide by and I think that you know Parpadelle is one of them it's something that is very rarely made machine wise it's something that's mostly handmade Mm -hmm. and the sauce is also something that takes a lot of love and care because wild boar doesn't have a lot of fat it takes a long time to cook and you really have to understand the meat to bring you know, it's proper flavor out. So I think it shows a lot of technique and it shows a lot about the area, Tuscany, because that's that's where you get it. Yeah. And it's delicious. That's uh yeah, that's uh I didn't even put that on my list. I totally forgot. Yes, it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I love Cingale. Whenever there was a sagra of Cingale outside of Florence, I mean we were there because Stefano loves 
chingale any type of chingale on the menu um you yeah that's a great that's a great dish um the one i thought of that a lot of people probably don't know of especially americans don't really know of and it's a summer dish so like you said like julia was saying like most of these dishes are seasonal is um panzanella oh yeah i didn't even think of that yeah panzanella (laughs) i used to make for myself in the the deep heat of summers in florence where you it's such an easy recipe to make but if you get it somebody else make it it's even better um because it's kind of a process but you get day-old bread you um i think you soak it and that's how i break yeah i think you soak it i'm trying to remember the last time i made it and then really you just add fresh veggies like um red onions um uh cucumbers i think tomatoes right um i think you could really make it it can make it with any type of i've never seen it with carrots though i want to put carrots in it but any type of like fresh veggie that you don't have to cook so the, yeah. the the story on this one i always liked hearing the story about panzanella is the farmers in tuscany especially in the the, the hottest months of, of summer this is what they would eat um for lunch because it was fresh it was um light um it filled them up because of the bread um and then they just put like drizzled like olive oil balsamic vinegar salt and pepper like that's it and it's such a simple dish that a lot of people don't know that it's it is a filling dish especially in the summer like any type of cold pasta salad rice um farro like those types of things I'll always remember of my summers in Italy because you're filled up and it's and it's fulfilling and it's also you know healthy because you put a lot of veggies in it and um yeah so that's the one that's, i was thinking yeah it's super tasty and um at home i really like to put uh, a bit of mozzarella and tuna oh, in it as well that's, that's also a good add-on yeah yeah really yeah and it's what i really like about it is that you can make it the day before or yeah. make it in the morning or make quite a lot of it and you can mm-hmm. leave it in the fridge and then eat off of it for a while so it's, yeah. it's nice when you're really busy and it's really hot and you don't want to be Turn standing over yeah. a stove or something yeah yeah that's really yeah. cool I, I think that's what i did i would make it for like a week and like ha- bring some with me in a container or i'd you know have it when i get home and again like you said it's nice when you don't have to stand over the stove with making pasta or making something else for lunch because in the middle of summer, when you live in Florence, it is a balmy 100 degrees, could be 90 to 100 yeah. degrees, like depending on what area of Florence you are living in. Definitely. Um, so freaking hot. Yeah. <laughs> God, I know. And there's no, there's something to understand about Florence as yeah. well, is that there's very, very little vegetation. You know, yes. there's no trees, there's no nothing. And you've got all of these piazzas, these squares that act like these microwaves that even oh that heat God. up the city even more. So it's, and it's very humid as well. It's not mm. a dry heat. So you're sticky, you're gross. You yeah, kind you're of like. Smelly. Ugh. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Yeah. I remember <laughs> when I, when I moved to live with Stefano on um, near um, Nuova Pignone, the GE plant on the other, closer to the airport. And I remember riding my bike back from the center of Florence. Like we would, for example, meet at Luca Leo's. We have a panino. We have some wine. And I, on the way home, I can feel the heat as I'm riding through the piazzas and the side streets and getting to the main viale and then getting to Statuto and then going through. Like I could feel the heat slowly leave my body, like as if I was going up a hill into the mountains. <laughs> And it was so weird. Like I'd get to like Viale di Redi. I don't know if you remember that road along the that that river, that yeah. little tiny like creek river. It's not. It's always dried up because it's so hot. Um, but <laughs> um, but I remember getting to that and going, oh my god, did I just get a breeze? Like, <laughs> like is it cool all of a sudden? And I get to Stefano's house or our house, and I'd be like, oh my god, like it's a completely different temperature than where I was in the center of Florence. So it is known Florence as an oven. So yeah. it's 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 real. It's um true, true, true. Um what's your next dish? 
that so yeah my next dish is something I'm not sure that you'll always be able to find but you'll be able to find certain variations okay. and it's one that has a very special place in my heart oh um, is it? so it's coniglio al umido oh. and what that is uh, coniglio is rabbit and I know for some of you people you're thinking of cute fluffy rabbits uh, but it's actually hair mm -hmm. and that made in a tomato kind of sauce so al umido basically just means in um oh you know something that is saucy mm -hmm. and uh many places will also make a roast rabbit mm -hmm. kind of version as well and that is also very very delicious but the reason why it's in the sauce, why I love that, and you know, it's got the black olives, you've got the capers, you've got, you got all of those strong, salty, very Tuscan kind of flavors mm -hmm. that I absolutely love. And the reason it's close to my heart is because my grandmother made it mm -hmm. uh, as I was growing up, and she would always serve it with polenta. So mm -hmm. if you are there in winter or autumn, or sorry, fall, well, you <laughs> um, can say autumn. We know. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> uh, definitely see if you can order that and my grandmother would make it and it's something she taught me to make until one day she told me okay we're gonna have a cook-off basically mm. and we both made the dish and invited friends and family over and people tried it and, and got to you know pick whose was whose mm. and no one could tell the difference between our food and she actually told me that night that mine was better oh and it was kind of like a you know you've you've surpassed the master kind of moment and she finally recognized that I was a cook of my own my mm -hmm. own doing my own making and I no longer had anything to learn from her and ever since then uh, I just I felt like I accomplished something yeah. <laughs> amazing and the dish itself why I would suggest to people to try it is because it's not easy to make mm. and you really have to understand rabbit mm -hmm. you have to understand the meat and how to prepare it properly and it takes many many hours even days to make a really good one mm. and you don't need a lot of it to be filled up and it just goes really well with polenta yeah it's it's so tasty and it's reminiscent of the time when people used to go hunting and people still do go hunting but back in the day especially my grandparents when our grandparents time mm -hmm. it was a lot more hunting and it's very reminiscent of that cacciatore mm -hmm. kind of sauces you know yeah. so the the hunter's sauce and it's something that they would have made for themselves when they went hunting or people who used to raise rabbits, which is what my um, grandmother comes from. Her family is of, you know, the peasants of Tuscany kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And her father used to go hunting and they used to raise rabbits and pigs and all sorts of things. And um, it was fascinating to hear those stories growing up and then finally being able to perfect this dish. Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee you, no matter where you go in Tuscany, you will find someone who's got that dish and will have a story just like this one for you. Yeah. And um, food always tastes better with a story, in my opinion. It does. it does. And I and I can say I've had that. I believe I have had that. I don't remember exactly when I had Cornelio uh, Umido, but I, I always, I always, when I first started going to Italy and there were things that I was like, I've never thought I would have this like rabbit or cow's tongue or um, octopus, like, you know, things yeah. that are different. Um, cow's brain, because Stefano loves cow's brain. Um, Cervello. And so when I, I believe it was one of those times when I'm just like, okay, I got to try it. I just have to try it. I don't have to put a judgment on it. Yes, we think of like fluffy rabbits when we think Cornelio, but these rabbits are like you said hairs so it's not like you know it's not like the rabbit you see in the pet store so um or you know around here where i live because they're everywhere 
Um, but yeah, no, I agree. I think though that is a great dish to try. And especially when there's a story along with it, which I've told a few stories on this podcast about dishes that I will never forget just because of who was around me, what was um, going on in my life. I just remember, um, that, um, the dish I was going to say next, which since we're going towards meat a little bit, I know we're going to go back yeah. to pasta because pasta's pasta's life. Um, yes. <laughs> um, the bisteca de alla Fiorentina. That's oh, one yeah. So this one is, um, I know we both had it, but it's a very okay. particular type of meat where you Americans don't like it as much because of the fact that it's can be um served quite rare and they don't like it and oh. and and it because they think it's like i don't know is it not like common bad. to have rare steak no 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 America? it's like medium medium well and you know sometimes people want it well done which is basically burnt um <laughs> But Sorry. like, but not like the steak I'm saying, but in general with meat, but when they see like a red type of meat, because uh, the bistecchina, the Fiorentina is a thick piece of, it's a porterhouse steak. For those of you that don't know, like a T-bone steak, there's a bone in the middle and there's, there's certain parts of the meat where it's, it's very, very tender when you cook it in a certain way. Like mm. Stefano, I forgot what he said. It's like, Two minutes on one side, three minutes on the other, two minutes, and then it's done. Yeah. And you and and all you do is is put um olive oil, salt, and pepper. That's all you need. And such a simple meat dish, expensive can be, um, but it's so good. And I never thought I would like such a rare meat because we're like taught not to eat red bread meat in the oh. States. And I don't know where that has come from, if it was from like a uh, you know, if a meat, if the red, if it's red, meaning that it's bad or it's not, you know, there's diseases. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. But when I moved to sure. Italy and when I started eating more meat and rare meats, like with red and al sangue is what they say with blood, which is probably not the best thing for an American to hear. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so good and it's so tender. And all you need is that olive oil, really good olive oil, salt and pepper, and you're done and like a sa side salad maybe you have some potatoes on the side um but it is definitely a go-to if you've never had a real florentine steak there's plenty of places in florence um that serve it i believe the one that's still the best which you probably know too is purseos off of piazza libertà um, but it, I, it could have changed. There's so many new restaurants in Florida, so That's I'm true. sure there's other, there's others that have a really good, um, meat. Um, so yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Cause you know, Americans for it's, sure don't try that stuff. Yeah. I would say definitely do try it and it will change your, it will change your world for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things to do is when eating it is taking some bread Mm. And then dipping it on the the meat juice with the olive oil mixed with the salt, and then yeah, the, the, I know that probably sounds gross to a lot of people, but it's absolutely delicious. It is, and I have <laughs> never had um a meat sauce like when we when I was growing up, uh, my mom didn't ever she never really put olive oil or anything on the meat. So when I met Stefano, like. And we have meat like every night because he's a meat eater. Um, but he would always be like, oh, do you want the juice? Chai sugo. There's the, the sauce. I'm like, oh, yes. Like from cooking the roast beef or the bistecchina di maiale, the pork chops or anything. Like we pour it on top. So we use everything. Like we were talking about in one of the episodes before, like Italians use everything. Like they don't want to throw away the juice. That's like the best part. <laughs> oh, my God. We used to... as. as as kids and even today we fight you know if my grandmother makes food we would fight over that yeah that yeah. that sauce even even she would make potatoes in a pan mm. you know she'd make with like olive oil and sage and a little bit of butter mm -hmm. we'd even fight over that leftover liquid yeah to like mop up <laughs> with like bread yeah, yeah. oh my oh, god it's so good it's so good nothing left behind you know you kind of you eat until the dishes look like they had no food in them mm -hmm. that's the idea yeah. yeah, no, for sure. Um, 
the other meat dish I was thinking of is, um, which I don't have as often as I'd like, is also buco. Oh, also buco. Now that's the, I mean, that you will find even in other areas, not just in Tuscany. Yeah. And um, it's also maybe not one for the squeamish because of the bone marrow, but it's delicious. I mean, it is delicious. And I, I, I don't remember exactly what is served with it, but I know it's like it's a slow cooked piece of meat and also buco meaning um, whole of hole in the bone basically is also his bone buco is whole so mm. when she just said like the bone marrow isn't that comes out of that it just makes it so tasty and like i don't know do do we have it over rice I, I'm, I'm vaguely remembering rice but is it not rice what do we usually um, eat I've, I've had it with rice or polenta depending polenta. on the season there you go yeah um but I think what's typical of it is because the, the osobuco, it's um, part of the shin. Yes. You know, so it's the shin bone and the meat there. So the reason it's called that is because it literally, you can see the whole, the bone marrow through mm -hmm. the, the bone. And I think most often my grandmother would serve it with um, like rice or just bread. You know. Yeah, that's right. With bread. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was trying to think like, what did I have it with? Cause it is a, it is um a dish that's pretty hearty. So I would say mm. definitely a winter dish, right? It's like late oh, fall, sure. winter. You want to, it, it fills you up. It's something you could put in the crock pot or like a slow cooker. Like it sits, it sits for a few hours, right? Mm. Yeah. I've never made yeah. it myself because we don't have good meat here. So um, <laughs> if I, if I, if I had some, I, I might try for my, my butcher, my farmer, farmer, Mike, um, that has a really good um, meat. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so also buco definitely, if it's on the menu, wherever you are in Italy in the winter time, I would definitely give it a try. Yeah. I would, I would as well. It's a, because you, I, I don't really know of any other, um, cultures that use, the shin in that kind of way mm. um at least at least not that in any way that is obvious to me so it would, it would be interesting to learn about it but it, it brings you a different perspective and I think it also enhances that idea of, of using every bit mm -hmm. of the animal you yeah. know you're not just um you're not just eating the good parts you know it's not just sure. about the steak it's not just about the fillet or mm -hmm. fillet how do other people say it the um <laughs> what, i don't know what you're trying to say <laughs> no worry. i know it's like a sirloin kind ah. of thing yeah yeah okay um, so I, I i it's one way of showing how a, a seemingly difficult piece of the animal can be transformed into this really tender, tasty, nutritious mm. food because bone marrow um, is actually really good for you. And if you have an iron deficiency, it's a really fantastic dish to eat. Yes. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, do you have any other meat dishes that you want to talk about? Because I don't... Whoa, no. Wait a minute. Okay, what? no, you go. I have, I have one. I just thought of one. I okay. forgot to write it down. Go ahead. So one... I guess it's not a meat dish per se, but as a starter, you get crostini. Okay. And right, so that's like like bruschetta, mm -hmm. but just small versions. And the ones that where they do liver, like yes. a liver. It's not it's not a pate, but it is a liver sauce kind of thing. Uh -huh. And that that is tasty. Even if you're not a liver eater, I would definitely give that a try. Yes. Um, it's, that one's my favorite it is my favorite we we make that now here we learned how to make it um stefano and i learned how to make it we take the chicken livers and now my butcher nearby um he actually sells us chicken liver and hearts and we make mm -hmm. it with both and it's so good guys it's not it's it, i i know you thinking of it and it's like you don't want to eat it but it is Whenever I go back to Italy, any time of the year, I'm like to my mother-in-law, I'm like, uh, Fagatino, <laughs> can we get that? I would like to eat it all. 
Um, it is so tasty. It is something very um, particular to Tuscany. Um, they're sometimes yeah. called crostini toscani. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they don't usually put, um, they don't usually say fegatino, I don't think, on the menu. But that's something you just have to try and just don't think about it. I had my parents try it. Um, they eat it, but they can't get out of their mind that it's liver. And I'm like, okay, it's fine. I'll eat the rest. <laughs> don't worry <laughs> don't worry it will not go to waste um oh, yeah i totally i totally get that though i i struggle with eating um liver pieces so like you know if you mm. make it into like a little bit of a liver steak or something sure. the, the texture really gets to me and um my my husband happens to be an amazing cook mm. and he has over the years slowly but surely gotten me used to eating liver in different forms and I'm still working at it <laughs> and and as someone who struggles with that kind of aspect of it you really just need to step outside of yourself and realize you know an animal had to die in order for you to eat mm -hmm. and the best way to be respectful of that is to just eat everything don't just pick and choose um where you can obviously other things you can't you can't eat everything. I mean, I think lung, you know, eating lungs for me would be like really gross, mm -hmm. but <laughs> there's other, there's other organs. I don't think I would want to eat either. <laughs> exactly. there's, there's certain things like Chivalo, you know, brain. I really don't like it. it, I, tried it. Me I tried it. And cause Stefano, I think I told this story before, I think maybe I haven't, but we were going out of town outside. We were leaving Galuzzo. We were going up the, mm -hmm. the south, southern part of uh, Florence. And there was this little trattoria, this little restaurant um, on the side of the road as we were leaving. And it had a huge sign outside, like a written sign that said, um, Cervello Fresco. Oh. Like fresh grain. <laughs> and I'm like, fresh and fresh. Stefano stopped like literally pressed down the brake and he's found the parking spot he's like we need to eat lunch now and i'm like um okay and it was happened <laughs> to be around lunchtime thankfully but he walked in there determined to understand if it was actually fresh brain okay and i was like literally literally i'm like he's like up to them like the host he's like is it really fresh is it really and he and they're like yeah i'm like and, and he's like okay we need a table for two and he's like freaking out and i'm like what is going on like i've never he's never talked about this dish and he's like the waiter comes over and he's like fresh brain please and he's like okay <laughs> and i'm like um pasta with pesto please <laughs> like you know yeah. <laughs> i don't know what i don't know what's gonna happen so i tried it <laughs> and i was surprisingly it it wasn't bad i didn't it, all it is is like he puts i think he put some olive oil i think he squeezed some lemon I can't remember yeah. what he did, but there was nothing else. Salt and pepper probably. And he ate it all. And it, again, as we always say with things that are kind of not the meat we choose to eat, it tastes like chicken. Yeah. That's usually what we say. And I, and I didn't, I didn't gag and it wasn't obviously those people that know what it is exactly. You probably, like you said, you're probably going to need to step out of your body, come back in and go like, okay, this is a cow's brain. It is fresh. It is okay. You're not going to die. It's, it's, it's actually really it's good. Yeah. So it was, it wasn't bad. I would probably try it again. Um, but that was the only time I tried it. But Stefano literally gave me one little piece and he's like, it's all mine. It's mine. I'm like, ah, I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Because his mom used to make it like his mom would go to the butcher down the street and get fresh brain like she ordered it and it has oh. to be fresh like it has to be recently slaughtered cow fresh brain because one time the story is is that his mom came home he had the fresh she had the brain and it like there's something that she noticed why it, it like collapsed like something yeah. I think like because all the nerves in the brain, like you can tell when it's not fresh. So she was pissed. It kind of, yeah, it like it like deflates. Or deflates, something. yeah. Yeah. So like she went back to that butcher and said, You guys better get me a better brain right now because this is not fresh. I've obviously I never met her, so I imagine she was angrier because apparently it was a delicacy in their household. So 
so yeah so brain take it or leave it if you want to try it agreed um there's there's that's exactly it it's it's some things you know you grow up learning like not to eat that or you just grossed out by it because things look weird yeah um and even myself I, w- I would probably try it it's you know even if I've had something before I would try it in different circumstances because you're your taste changes as you get older and sometimes if it's prepared in a different way you react to it differently oh, you yeah. know like let's take broccoli for example or cabbage if someone just boils it for half an hour and then gives it to you it's disgusting but yeah. you lightly fry it you know a bit of salt a bit of lemon juice it's delicious yeah it's amazing totally. so agreed but at the same time brains it's, it's difficult it's difficult for me to take it seriously being yeah. uh, someone who watches a lot of you know like zombie movies i'm just like oh fresh bread like <laughs> 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 yeah that's that that definitely would not be um ideal yes <laughs> no. let's let's, but, let's let's move on from brain because we can go okay. on probably enough brains <laughs> we won't go to any other um body parts yet or organs yet but um the the one that i was thinking of that i absolutely love and I, and there's certain places probably that do it better, but I can't, I remember eating this all the time when I was living in Florence, um, tagliato di manzo. Oh yeah. With, um, arugula on top with a little bit of shaved Parmesan, Parmigiano. It's so good. And it's simple. Again, simple. They, ta- sure. they tagliata means, uh, to cut. So like uh, they're very thinly sliced pieces of meat that are a little rare. So it is red meat um, and you just drizzle olive oil, salt and pepper. And it's so good. And of course, you always get a side of potatoes with it. It's usually potatoes or you're going to get a vegetable, other type of vegetable. But I always that that was like my go to night dish. If I went out to dinner with a friend, I remember always going out with my friend Simone from Joshua Tree and we'd go to a place around the corner and that's what I would always get because it was always delicious because it was a little mm-hmm. hole in the wall type of restaurant. Um, but yeah, that one for sure you got to try. And even if you don't like arugula, oh, sure. just push it to the side. It's still there's something about having that like sour, bitter um, arugula with the, the salty Parmigiano and then the olive oil with the meat. Oh, my God. It's just like a perfect mix of loveliness in your mouth. It is so good. So that's true good. so good yeah um yeah so that was the one i was thinking of oh that was very tasty and that was you said it's it's so hard going down this road because it's just like there's so many dishes that i think of i'm like i want to eat them now i know I now not. i'm getting hungry even though it's only 10 30 here um <laughs> but like i'm like oh gosh i'm hungry um <laughs> what other one? Oh, um so I have some desserts on my list, but um, I thought we'd go back to like pasta. So oh, pasta. when yeah. you go to Rome, you must try cacio e pepe. Oh, yes, I was going to bring cacio e pepe up as well. Okay, good, um, good, good. You can get it anywhere, I feel like. Can you get it in the north? Is it any in the restaurants where you are? Uh, or no? Yeah, you can get it in most places, but you'll yeah. you'll find it like carbonara and cacio e pepe, you'll find more rome side yes oh um, carbonara was the other one on my list i love it oh my god yeah carbonara is i oh. i think carbonara is amazing but i'm more of a cacio e pepe kind of person okay um and the reason i thought of that dish is because it was one outside of my family that i discovered on my own okay and there's always something exciting about discovering a dish that nobody you know knows about mm-hmm. you know it's yeah. just like what what is there to expect and learning to make it as well even though it's simple you know you've got your hard cheese so it's usually pecorino mm-hmm. and uh butter pasta water and pepper like with salt so have you have you perfected it because we've tried to make it and it's not it's like it either is too peppery or I don't know, but you might have to send me that recipe because just how you make it. Um, I'll definitely go through it with you, but it's one of those dishes where yeah. you kind of have to get to a point where it clicks okay. when you're making it. 
it's okay. so difficult to actually follow a recipe because it's it is more technique than we've, anything else we've tried so many and like we haven't found one we really like the same thing with carbonara so i've yes. finally found the right the right amount of like eggs and then the the right bacon we're gonna use or the pancetta um like it, it was a few times like we tried to figure out he did it with the twirly like the egg yolks just that and then th there's like that those two are very um it's like a learn you have to learn how to you, trial and error trial and yes. error on those because not like you know aglio and pepperoncino which is very very easy to make um but those you have to there's like different types of consistency different types of um maybe cheese like I don't know, but like those two are a tough, um, tough pasta dishes to, uh, or the sauces to kind of make it right for you because you, you could like it a different way. Yeah. Oh, exactly that. And I mean, just getting it so that it kind of emulsifies properly is really, is really not easy. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is a fantastic dish to try. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest going to a restaurant that is known for cacio e pepe or yes. known for carbonara don't don't just go to in, like anywhere and yeah. get it go to a yeah. place that's known for making it yeah because it, it it's seemingly something that won't fill you up you know when you look at it you're like oh there's like nothing on the plate but then yeah. you eat it and you realize how full you are oh my god yes <laughs> especially carbonara carbonara definitely yeah. fills me up nice and toasty like nice my belly's <laughs> nice and warm but um, yeah, no, I agree. I think because a lot of the tourist places in Rome for those particular dishes, mm -hmm. it's always on the menu. But if you look it up on, online or research like a restaurant that's known for it, yeah, I would definitely sign up and go to that restaurant. So better part, just go and try it in Italy before you try to make it, obviously. And then you fall definitely. in love with it and then you want to make it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually how it goes. <laughs> um so yeah so Casha pepe i said and the carbonara was on my list okay so as much as we we'll, we'll go to another type of not kind of a squirmy type of dish because mm -hmm. not a lot of americans like shellfish okay so the, okay. you have to try if you're in italy on the seaside mostly on the seaside is spaghetti alle vongole or spaghetti di frutti di mare with scallops and and mussels and cozze uh, mm, you will not you you will come back to me years later and say thank you god for telling me about this because <laughs> as much as if you are not if you live in the midwest like i do in the middle of the states where there is no seaside ever anywhere near us and you try like spaghetti alle vongole all the mussels okay you can get it in the middle of the states but it's totally different when you go to the seaside in, in Italy. Yeah. There's a different taste. They make it differently. It's just to die for. And I and I probably talked about this before, but when I we went to Puglia in 2019, every single day, Julia, every single day, I had mussels with with pasta by themselves. I had huge gamboroni. I had huge shrimp. Every single day on the seaside. It was the most amazing trip. It was so... And I wasn't like overly full because fish, mm -hmm. as you know, is not... It doesn't fill you up like pasta or bread and like all the time. Yeah. It's a hidden secret, especially for Americans. If you do not... Have you never tried clams or mussels or scallops or... Or big shrimp, or um, I'm trying to think of another like type of fish. Like, there's different fish there too. I was gonna say I can't remember the like orata. Orata is a really good fish. I don't know if you've oh, ever tried that. I actually forgot about that. Yes, <laughs> it's pretty good. But yeah, so that even if you're I not a shellfish orata. person, you've got to try it, people. Like you've got to just step out of your comfort zone, like you do with brain and liver. Like mm. step out, give it a try. Um. I haven't had any family members fall in love with it as much as I have. <laughs> I've tried. My sister, when she visited me a few times when we were living there, I would, you know, she, I would like, hey, try this muscle. You have to try it. She's like, oh, I can't. I'm like, oh, it's so good. I'm like, it's, it's so the texture. Good. I feel it's like the texture. I understand. Because I remember the first time I had a clam. I was just like, oh, but then, oh, the flavors, people. 
the flavors and when they're prepared just right they can be quite amazing i think you know um my my grandfather is was a sailor for most of his younger years Mm. and he, he always had a love for the sea for the ocean yeah and um you know he didn't cook often but when he did it was always squid ink pasta oh. with vongole mussels or clams mussels yeah. um calamari you know oh. like all of those mixed into this sauce and it you could if you could just taste how it was made with love and understanding mm-hmm. um and it was always something that he made you yeah. know nobody else made it in the house and yeah. it was a treat it was like oh, exciting yeah. Oh, yeah. um definitely I would definitely try it because there are very few things like you know sitting at a restaurant looking out onto the Mediterranean oh sun setting I, I'm, I'm there now I'm closing my eyes there now right because <laughs> we're in the middle of winter here so cold we haven't seen the sun in like three weeks Ugh. <laughs> so like ugh. um anyway back to food um do you have any other fish like i i didn't think of any other specific fish or i didn't think of a specific like fish one yeah you're saying hello sadie hello oh (laughs) kitty just said hi to me (laughs) um but the dish that did help me deal with my sort of issues with um with seafood is pepata now (gasps) Yes. Pepata is just mussels mm. made with, you know, water straight from the sea, from the ocean, that's got a lot of pepper in it. And you eat it with bread. You know, mm. Sometimes there's a bit of white wine in there too. Yes, that's the it best. takes maybe at most seven minutes to cook. And it's delicious. Oh. It is delicious. That fresh bread with the mussels and that peppery sauce. And there's just this intense connection with your food, where it comes from, where you mm. are, because you've got the saltiness in what you're eating and the saltiness in the air and everything's just this yeah. amazing moment and nothing else really matters when you eat that dish. Oh. You, are, you are there, you're in the zone. Yeah. And that's I barely, it. I barely breathe when I eat a pipasa, they, they call it, like, anagotse, whatever it's called, but I, me and Stefano would fight for those. Like, well, is there a muscle there? No, no, no. I'm like, just, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I, I can't stop eating them. And now like, it's so hard to find like a place around here that has a good hefty size of kotze of muscles because it just, it, I, you gotta go to the seaside. You gotta go seaside. You gotta find it. You gotta eat it all. With the bread, with the olive oil, with the olive oil, with the white wine inside. Oh my god, that's all I want right now. (laughs) Right. Oh my god, it is so delicious and good, people. Mm. It it it's almost even though it's such a simple dish and it's a dish that people have made because they live close to the ocean and it's easy to make because it's ingredients that they had available. Uh There is a guilty pleasure when eating it. You know, and I think that's true for a lot of Italian dishes, even though much of it's like peasant food. Yeah. It is so good and it invokes that feeling of like, do I deserve to eat such amazing food? You know, like so true. So true. When even like we had we had mussels at a restaurant nearby um this week, and I I was like how can I was like looking around at the other tables. I'm like, how could you not eat this? Like, I was like, you guys are missing out. <laughs> they're all mine and you're missing out. Like they're so good. Cause I'm not sharing. <laughs> it's not like a common thing. Americans eat unless they are on like in Florida or in California or something. I don't know if they have good muscles or not, but um, you don't find it on the menu. Like even when we were in mm-hmm. Key West uh, two years ago, you did not find muscles on the menu. Cause it's not a, it's not a, I don't think it's a Gulf, like Gulf of Mexico, ocean, Pacific ocean type of dish. You find it in the Mediterranean sea. You find it in the Adriatic probably. And yeah, you don't, I don't think there are good, um, uh, place to find the mussels in mm-hmm. these places. So 
I don't know. I could be wrong, but I don't know. Um, yeah. That's so cool. Well, that's definitely one mm-hmm. one to try out. Yeah. Um, and even if it's not Pepata specifically, like you said, if you're like in Puglia or mm-hmm. anywhere on the coast, you know, whether it's Amalfi, Le Marche, wh- wherever it is. Anywhere. Anywhere. Find it. You'll find mussels anywhere. I feel yeah. like. I've never been to Calabria or Sicily, but I believe that they're like, you know, booming with mussels. I don't know. Exactly. But I believe For it. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, what all right, else well, you got? What? <laughs> I said, what else you got for us? Well, I was I was um, thinking of a dessert that's kind of similar to tiramisu, but it's not. Because I found mm. it when I lived in when I lived in Florence, and and you might have went, you might have had it with me. Do you remember Pangies that restaurant? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so they would have it. They had a local a local bakery or something, uh, pasticceria make it for them. Um, but Zucotto. Oh yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, that's you very tasty. I don't. That one is um something I just had actually recently. Um, Maria at the villa for our September retreat. People, she is an expert <laughs> chef, and she made individually sized zucotto for us one night. Oh my god! It just brought back all these memories because I remember Pangies because that was the first time I ever tried it, and I couldn't. I never found it anywhere else, and maybe I never looked for it. But it's a. It's a. I think it's a. Is it a Sicilian dessert or no? I don't even know where it's actually from, but it is so good. I don't even know how to describe it. It's like a sponge cake with, I think there's a little bit of liqueur in it and like a cream. I can't remember exactly. I didn't even, all I I know is it's amazing and you need to try it. Uh, Oh, Zucotto is from Florence, actually. Oh, it is from Florence. Oh, then I, maybe that's why I was thinking it was somewhere else because I never found it anywhere else but I don't I think it's it's a it can be a complicated dish or dessert to make yes. maybe that's why they don't make it and also usually it's in an individual cup and yeah, kind of like panna cotta also. kind of yeah panna cotta yeah. creme caramel caramel I think it's kind of like that because it's in a like a um but Maria of course when I t- asked her I'm like this is such a hard di- thing to make she's like no it's not like well apparently because you've been making it for years she used to a hotel so she made it for the hotel and stuff so i'm like okay um but zucotto is is by far probably outside of like tiramisu because tiramisu is also one of my favorites um zucotto is uh, uh is probably like first with a close second of tiramisu mm-hmm but if you tell me another dessert, mm-hmm. I could completely, I could completely have forgotten about it, and like that's also a good one too. <laughs> um, oh, let me think. Let me think. I, strangely enough, tiramisu because my my grandmother she makes it without the mascarpone and instead uh. makes a, a crema, a type of custard that she okay. puts in instead of the mascarpone, and so I traditional. Tiramisu, I find difficult to eat. Okay. Uh, it's just a completely different flavor. And it's I'm just like, no, I don't want this. Whereas yeah. the one my grandmother makes with the custard instead, I love that. Do you I know how to make it? it? I don't. Oh. She never um she never taught me. So I'm probably gonna have to get on the phone with her at some point in the week and be like, okay. Now I need to tell me now. Too. Tell me how to make it. Tell me how to make it. Yeah. Um, um yeah, Stefano, yes. Stefano made Teramisu the first time for us for Christmas. Like Ooh. we just he he um yeah, he's awesome at making like desserts. He makes his own kind of cream where he just learned I don't know if he learned from his mother or his friend Marco, who's really good at making creme brulee. Mm-hmm. Um but he just whips it up every so often. And sometimes he mixes like Nutella in or something like some sort of chocolate powder, Nesquik or something. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, yeah. Tiramisu, it, it's a memory for you. Yeah. That, that mm. your grandmother made it with custard. So I understand that. And um, I'm just looking, Oh, maybe the sun might be coming out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of any, uh, I mean, 
in Italy, there's always like a chocolate cake on the menu yeah. or profiteroles, like yeah. profiteroles, which is like the cream puff balls with chocolate drizzled on top. Beignet, which is a French thing, but it's the same type of thing. You can find that. Them. Yeah, you can find them in. Um, I think you can. You definitely find them as a dessert. I've seen them at, as a dessert in Italy, but also you find them in a pasticceria at a pastry shop, mm -hmm. um, which is also delicious. Um, but and then oh, the always famous one on a really hot night in Florence is stopping by your local gelateria. Oh, for sure. And that's like, there's certain gelateria in Florence that make it better than others but, but for the most part you're gonna be okay yeah for the most part you're fine just try whatever i always pers my favorite is basho uh, and something with nutella like if it's a nutella blend i always love it with nutella and uh, i don't know for me like i used to i always i tried all of them like with um like fruit and stuff like there's the mm -hmm. fragola there's um uh what's the other fruit melone melon strawberry there's a bunch of different fruit ones but i i don't know i always think okay you're having gelato and it's a dessert chocolate's got to be there somewhere so i always <laughs> need to have chocolate with it uh because then i just feel bad for not getting the nutella one or the basho <laughs> i'm just like oh i just got the i got like the healthy quote unquote gelato <laughs> with with melon or strawberries or i mean they're all delicious my our best friend's mother her her mom and dad used to run a gelateria outside of florence in inchiza a ton of inchiza mm -hmm. and then during the pandemic they had to close and everything so she her mom made like the best gelato i because it's a it's an it's a craft making it gelato is. so um but again when you go to the, any city, any place, gelato is good everywhere. So you got to try it. You got to try um, it. It's, a different, it's different than the American ice cream and probably ice cream in South Africa as well. For sure. Actually, on that yeah. note, so my favorite flavors just by the way, are pistacchio and stracciatella. Oh, stracciatella. Uh, yeah. Stracciatella is basically kind of like a chocolate chip yeah. sort of yeah. one and pistacchio is pistachio um it's delicious mm -hmm. but fun fact do you know what the difference is between ice cream and italian ice cream gelato no i do not so normal ice cream by, by normal i mean for other countries that's not italy uh -huh. uh, it is quite literally cream that has been worked and then iced so ice cream uh -huh. and then you know it's flavored cream that's been iced and gelato is made with egg yolks and so first a custard is made in a specific way and then the custard is cooled and then it's churned with cream in order to make gelato oh sounds so much better and so it's actually a um it's a very interesting thing to thing that people have to do and at some point in the 1800s italians moved to england and gave everyone salmonella because they used bad oh. yolks. Oh, <laughs> I did not know this. <laughs> I thought it was a really funny story. I'm like, of course, Italy. Of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. Oh, I did not know that story at all. Um, oh. but uh, really yeah. So, do you have any other dishes that people should try when they visit Italy? Uh, I'm. I do have one, and okay. this is not one that I that is necessarily my story, but it's something I'd like to share because of mm. how much my husband loves it. Okay, and he got to eat it at my grandparents' place when he was staying there um, before moving to Italy to join me here. Okay, so it's his own personal, um, like special story with okay. my grandparents and it's with nettles so ravioli uh. ravioli the word itself actually just means dumpling so it's any filled pasta okay and they would always have nettles in the garden and so they prepared uh ravioli 
with a filling of nettles and cheese, which would typically be like ricotta or mm -hmm. some kind of soft cheese like that. And they made it for him. And he describes it as being a very delicate flavor that can be paired with quite a lot of different sauces and it's a must. So if you do go to a restaurant in Italy and they happen to have nettle ravioli, give it a try. Uh, What's it you'll called be surprised. in Italy, in, in, in Italian, nettles? Nettle, oh God. Because I don't even know. I was going to ask you, what exactly is nettles? I... Like, and it's specifically stinging nettle, just by the way. Okay. Um, give me a second, because yeah. for some reason, oh, I know it's like it was an O or something. Because I've never, and now I want to know what that is. Now I want to try it, because I've never <sighs> had it. Um, Or ortica. Ortica. Yeah. Oh, nettles is a plant. Yes. It's like a leaf. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I've never, I've actually never had that. Is that something particular to Luca? The nettles or no? Nettles grow throughout Italy um, and actually throughout Europe. So you'll even find in uh, like England, you know, they also have nettle grow. Yeah, I've heard of it in England. There. Yeah. So every single country has a different way of, of making it. Yeah. And what I, from what I understand from uh, my grandmother, when we chatted mm -hmm. about it sometimes some months ago, she said that it's, it's just something that people would make because, mm -hmm. you know, they would go hunting. Like her father was a hunter. So she would go with and then happen to be there and then forage the nettles and make something from it. Okay. So I think you can find it throughout. Uh -huh. But because stinging nettles are not considered necessarily a sellable item, you oh. know, it's not like, I don't know, other filling, you know, like meat fillings. It doesn't have the same kind of pizzazz for people. Uh -huh. um, but it's something that I think a lot of Tuscans, a lot of older Tuscans are very familiar with. Okay. And uh, it's also apparently very nutritious. Stinging oh. nettles apparently got quite a few vitamins and minerals in them. Okay. So I did not know I'd this. Give it a try. I, have you seen it on menus in in Italy? I've seen it in one or two places, more like osterias, so places okay. that tend to specialize in dishes. Okay. Um, but if you do have the chance of going to someone's house and they make it for you. Yeah, that, would, that would also be awesome. Um, if we ever open up a cafe one day, maybe we'll add it to the menu. Yeah, because <laughs> I've never had that. Now I'm I'm wondering what it actually tastes like. I I don't remember having it as an adult. Whereas oh. for my, um, you know, for my husband, they made the dish and it obviously stood out. Yeah, and I'm trying to recall having eaten this. My grandmother's made me so many different types of dishes. Sure. sure um and some she just didn't make as as often as others and I really cannot recall if I have eaten it uh -huh. but I do know that you know I had eaten kale for most of my life and she always told me that it was cabbage uh -huh. and uh, the translation was bad and I didn't know it was kale and then you know kale became like a popular food yes and I was like oh what the hell is kale only to discover that <laughs> you've been eating it for eaten. years so <laughs> Who knows what else I've been eating without knowing. It's been in your stable <laughs> diet for years. <laughs> well, the funny thing with kale, so to trick Stefano, I used to call it just spinach. Oh, just spinach. Just eat it. It's fine. Because he didn't like the taste of kale. But now he loves it. Like now, ah, I, you know, I mix it with like a sauce or something for a pasta dish. And he's just like, oh, okay. And sometimes if I have the kale in the in the crisper, and like mm -hmm. he he's like he's making the the dish for lunch and he just takes it out and he makes it he's not with me like saying you can you put the kale in there because we need to use it so obviously he likes it otherwise exactly. like why is he putting it in there um, if you do have if you do have like pancetta or bacon yeah with the kale really um, delicious oh we do have that delicious oh maybe we're having that for lunch today Maybe. I don't know. 
Um, okay, well, I think uh, we've given our audience a pretty good list of dishes to try. A mouthful. Um, a mouth- yeah, a mouthful. Exactly. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any other questions about these dishes or um, maybe there's something that you want us to talk about, as always, I have that um, the voicemail for you to leave a quick 90 second message about what you want us to talk about or what you want me to talk about. If it's living in Italy, traveling to Italy, um, something about Northern Italy. Cause now that Julia's becoming an expert of foraging and stuff like that, if you're interested in that, um, yeah, let us know. Um, as always, um, you can join my email list where you can get up to date information about my travel retreats, my, um, uh my wine excursions eventually that will be a thing and um and if you wanted to purchase wine from me which is something i'm slowly getting into with these four vineyards and mm-hmm. surprisingly enough i'm getting random like follows by vineyards near like where um in monteferrale and like tuscany and chianti cool. that they're <laughs> like oh you know we can feel it so I'm I'm will be excited to eventually meet all these other vineyards and these winemakers. Um and then just like what I said at the beginning, if you didn't catch the beginning, um the deadline to join our retreat in September, September 2nd through the 9th is March 12th. Um so book your spot. I have six spots left. Um I can't wait to have you in Tuscany and be with Maria and my mother-in-law Fernanda. It'll be an amazing experience. Um, so share this episode with anybody that might be going to Italy because we have a lot of good tips for you um, to try yes. these, these recipes. Um, Julia, do you have anything to say to finish off? Um, I uh, obviously you don't want this episode to go on forever, um, <laughs> but we didn't even touch on, you know, mushrooms. And perhaps oh. in the next episode, we could speak a little bit about mushroom culture, because that's a very big part of Italian living, particularly porcini mushrooms. Oh, um, yes. And also the most famous one. Tartufo. Yes. Tartufo. yes. Oh, the yeah. one that I do not particularly like. But you don't like, but if you, like the specific, if you like the porcini, which I'm not, I like porcini as well, but Tartufo is amazing <laughs> for me it's true people who do like it absolutely adore it so yeah. if you're into mushrooms or you have mushroom questions and not the drug know. mushrooms we're talking about eating mushrooms in a dish let's be clear let's yeah, be clear yeah. not drug, hallucinate drug mushrooms, mushrooms or <laughs> yeah. you'll have to go to a different podcast yeah today. there's probably another one out there <laughs> for those types of mushrooms um <laughs> but yeah allora buongiorno buonasera wherever you are or oh, buonanotte i'll say that again buongiorno buonasera buonanotte wherever you are <laughs> and thanks for listening to this amazing podcast thank you julia a presto yeah. ci si vede alla prossima <laughs> I am beyond grateful for you listening to my podcast right now. I am so excited to share my journey of living abroad and all my stories of Florence and Italy and all the places in between that I've visited. If this has reached you in any way and you would like to continue, please subscribe now. Also, go check out my website, Truly Italy dot tours for all my travel experiences. Ci si vede. Ciao.